Generic greetings and welcome back to Science Insanity. Today we are continuing on second part of the Reunification War Trilogy. The first episode we covered how the Star League came to be, how Ian Cameron, the greatest statesman of all time, politely asked to make an empire and somehow convinced everyone else that, yeah, this is fine, let's go along with it. Then he made his wife basically the very top general for the biggest military ever because nepotism isn't a thing in Battletech. No, not at all. And today, we are going to be covering the Star League buildup of its military, how everything moved into the position for the greatest war humanity had seen before the Succession Wars at least, and we're going to be talking about how the Star League stumbled and fumbled a little bit before flexing its way to glory. So, you ready to go, Steve? I didn't get introduced though, so I mean, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm actually oh, ready to Oh go. yeah, yeah, that's right. Fair enough. Sorry about that. Filling in for the role of the audience and the entirely illiterate is Steve. He's going to be vicariously standing in for all of the non-initiated into Turbo Nerd culture. Say hello, Steve. Hello. There you go. You got your intro. I hope you're happy. So can we move on I, now? I am very much happy, sir. <laughs> I, uh, my life has been fulfilled. <laughs> that brief moment of pure sadness when you thought that you weren't going to get to do your oh-so-simple introduction. It's like a sad puppy. I really had one, man. It was... It was not a good time over here. <laughs> <laughs> Having existential dread over there. Am I real? Do I matter? What's even happening? I was thinking about just not saying anything until I actually got introduced. Uh, I'm glad you didn't. I would have spent the first 20 minutes thinking that I had somehow messed up the audio <laughs> settings and we would have just been at the worst <laughs> impasse ever. All right. So before we get into anything else, let's quickly take a brief look back at the last episode rather than just plugging it and going over. So the reunification war. Firstly, the entire reason that this came about is because the Star League wanted to be the only power in humanity, and being the brainchild of Ian Cameron, the greatest statesman of all time, it's essentially operated like a dictatorship. Ian Cameron spent the better part of, well, his entire life politically maneuvering around all of the great houses in the Inner Sphere and coming up with unbelievably dumb and unbelievably brilliant solutions to problems that, well, have been going on for frankly longer than a lot of people have been alive. And he somehow managed to get all of the great houses united together by hook or by crook, all under one banner of the Star League. And of course, because he founded the Star League with the express intention of bringing the best quality of life, education, peace, and prosperity to humanity, the very first thing that he wanted to do was force the rest of humanity outside of the Inner Sphere underneath the Star League's banner. By conflict. Because there is absolutely no double think going on when you found an organization for peace and then immediately declare war against everyone. We are for peace. Please do not resist. <laughs> we, we've come to enforce peace upon you. Please do not resist. You are being liberated. We have a really chunky quote later on that I'm going to read in its entirety because it does an amazing job of summarizing the just insane mentality of the people going into this. And that brings us to, well, the actual Star League military. Because you can't really fight a war without a military. And this, it's just, this is one of those moments when I genuinely had to go, what in the name of God? Now, I'm not saying that Ian Cameron's wife was not very qualified. I'm sure she was an amazing person. I'm sure she was very intelligent. I'm sure that she was a brilliant stateswoman just like her husband was a statesman. But I, I really... You might not be saying it. I'm saying she's unqualified, though. Fuck that girl. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Yeah, let's just go out with this. She wasn't qualified. What... Ian Cameron didn't, like, promote her to managing the military or anything. He basically went, Okay, wife of mine, for our anniversary present, you are now the supreme commander of the biggest military humanity has ever seen. Go wild, madam. Enjoy. And then she did. Why? How? Who? I have no idea, but somehow it worked out. Everything just fell into place like you were playing Tetris, and he just lined up that perfect four-row score. As for the actual Star League military, long story short, it it's disgustingly large. It take the American military compared to the rest of the world, 
and then like triple that ratio and you basically have the SLDF. They drew a huge percentage of the military from the Terran hegemony, as well as a massive percentage of the military from all of the great houses, combining it together into one ridiculously unwieldy monstrosity that could probably like 1v3 anything in Battletech and win, because even from the very conception of it, it was hilariously more powerful than anything else around it. Unfortunately, it was extremely divided and not particularly effective at really doing anything due to having, well, six different empires all needing to coordinate their vastly different militaries to make it work. So, with a brief summary of what we went over the first time out of the way, let's move on to the actual episode. The build-up and the issues, or I guess the, the teething issues that the Star League had, how it got ready for the greatest war of all time, and some more political maneuvering by Ian Cameron to make sure that everyone, at least on the Inner Sphere side, was definitely on board for this war. So, a few big issues cropped up immediately after the founding of the Star League and after they decided that, yeah, they're going to conquer everything else. To ensure Star League supremacy, a quota was put on the Great Houses. Remember how I said that the Star League drew from their militaries to bulk up its numbers? Well, the maximum number of military units and personnel the Great Houses had, or at least could legally have under the Star League Charter, was drastically reduced. After they met this quota, they had to give the remaining forces to the SLDF. Anyone else, along with any other military equipment that was left over, needed to either be donated to the SLDF or disposed of. And you can imagine that a mass amount of military personnel fresh out of a job with a ludicrous amount of hardware just lying around scheduled for scrap or, well, you know, recycling, they became pirates, warlords, and brigands pretty much immediately, taking over quite a few different sectors of space generally causing a ruckus and being just a pain in the ass. Oh no, whoever could have foreseen such occurrences. Certainly no one. You know what the, you know what the best part about this is? They didn't take the weapons away first. Like, at least when the soldiers and stuff came home from World War I and then everything went to shit, like, immediately afterwards, you know, they took the guns away from the veterans first. So this became a rather severe issue, and there was one particularly embarrassing affair where a Capellan world came under attack by a rather large group of pirates that had recently been kicked out of the Capellan military because, you know, downsizing and all that, their jobs got cut. Sorry, man, no pension, no benefits for you, out the door. Is this just a Capellan moment? I don't know. I... It, Okay, so this is this was happening all over the Inner Sphere, but I'm gonna be honest, I feel like there's a reason that the writer chose for the Capellans to be the ones that, you know, this entire event happened to. It just, it feels right that it was the Capellans we're that were doing sorry, this. We're sorry, Capellan fans. We, we never will be. So, when the Capellans sent one of the remaining proper military units to go deal with it, somehow, the guy in charge bungled it so badly that he sent a military regiment that was actually still very acquainted with the pirates. Because the pirates were the members that got cut from that unit, and so, they refused to fight them. And when the Capellans called for help from the SLDF to come in and clean their mess up, that extra Capellan unit ended up joining the pirates to fight the SLDF. And this was a very, very bad look, both for the Star League, because it seemed that it couldn't maintain order and couldn't deal with its own factions, and for the Capellans, because everyone looked at them like, what the hell is wrong with you? Yeah, no, this is actually just a certified Capellan moment. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's really no other way to take that for this. Yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty much. Maybe, quote unquote, retiring massive amounts of people like that with no severance package probably wasn't the best idea in hindsight. To combat no, I mean, this... I mean, that part was fine. It was, it was the fact that they sent their own uh, battle buddies in there for them. <laughs> that was the actual Capellan moment out of all this. <laughs> you don't send friends to kill friends, you colossal idiot. It's never gonna work. So, to combat this issue, the Great Houses and the Star League found a rather clever workaround and shook hands under the table with the Star League to make it work. Mercenaries became almost institutionalized, 
While they were around for a while by this point, the massive influx of out-of-work military personnel were hired on as <clears throat> quote-unquote security personnel for nobles and security contractors for industrial magnates, read private armies, okay? More were still organized into official mercenary outfits along old unit lines and begin operating as paramilitary forces for their parent great houses. This let the great houses maintain a way bigger force on paper than they were allowed to under the Star League Charter, but also meant that suppressing rebellions, political dissent, corporate espionage, dicking with the other great houses, all of that stuff no longer needed to be done by the proper military, and instead could be done by these paramilitary mercenary groups, which was not only far messier, because, you know, mercenaries don't give a shit about civilian casualties and optics in a war, because what do they care, it was also far cheaper and far easier to get plausible deniability when, um, a bunch of marauders accidentally burned down a Federated Sun base, totally not using Draconis Combine mechs while doing it. No, certainly not. They wouldn't be that stupid. I mean, to be honest, though, the Draconis Combine probably wouldn't. They they hate mercenaries and have hated them basically forever. So this this basically meant that mercenaries became state-sanctioned institutions of power projection and problem solving. It was a little unstable, but this directly gave rise to Battletech as a series we know, with mercenary companies and all of the roleplay characters and customization that people love for the actual game. That's basically where this came from. Right here is where mercenaries became enshrined in the lore. However, the SLDF had a better idea for those unemployed masses. The United Triumph Military Exercises. Hereby known as the UTME, because I cannot be bothered to say such a long-winded name every time. The Star League basically decided, Hey, wait a minute. We have a shitload of unemployed military professionals in the biggest untested army ever with no experience. Why don't we have war games? And then they proceeded to organize the biggest series of war games and exercises ever seen across the entire Inner Sphere to test out their shiny new toys and get those wannabe pirates re-employed so they can cut down on all of this gnarly raiding and commerce issues that they were dealing with. Because one of the biggest things about the Star League was that piracy, supposed to be gone, stability, supposed to be universal, and money was supposed to flow free. And it was kind of cramping their style with what was going on. Now, these massive military exercises required that so many of these people to be hired back that it basically eliminated the problem overnight. It was also supposed to show the galaxy that humanity was going to be united. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. The most powerful military the universe had ever seen is just rocked up on your doorstep, and they're going to show you just how effective they are. The UTME was scheduled to take place in 2572. It would involve 10 full Star League Defense Force divisions facing down an equivalent force from the Great House militaries, similar in style at least to the Battle of Tukiad, but on a much, much larger scale. The two forces would fight across 50 worlds, all bordering the periphery nations, and while not directly televised in its level of openness, it would still be highly reported on and used as a propaganda tool. And we're going to kind of delve off into the weeds for a second here, because a single SLDF division, which by the way is like, that is a gigabig number of military forces in the Battletech universe, okay? Like that is an absolutely ludicrous number of dudes and mechs. It was basically equivalent to an entire sector army fielded in the modern 3025 era. So you know like the, the warring states that we have in the general lore overview of the Great Houses right after the Succession Wars? You remember that, right, Steve? Yes. Take the entire military force that a Great House would put on one of its borders. That's what a single SLDF division was. And the SLDF could bring 10 of them to bear while still maintaining tons more for actual defense and garrison duty across the Inner Sphere. So the amount of force that was being put on display here was genuinely monstrous. So when the actual exercises began, like I mentioned, the intent was to shock the periphery realms into signing the Star League Accords and falling in line. It was supposed to be an unrivaled show of force to prevent future bloodshed. 
it unrivaled. instantly it instantly went to shit. Like drunken uncle, drunken uncle at Christmas levels of uncomfortable, humiliating, and rage inducing for the Star League. There was no controlling the runaway disaster that was on display. The SLDF had basically no coordination, no cohesion. They were making hilariously clumsy mistakes like reading communication orders wrong, having actual deployment directions mixed up, or outright rookie mistakes that led to the SLDF being outmaneuvered and defeated by the significantly less advanced and significantly lightly or armed house militaries time and time again. It was a pathetic showing from the Star League. It went so bad that most of the periphery who came to watch these military displays, genuinely intimidated and afraid, left laughing, basically shrugging off the SLDF as nothing more than spheroid bluster, believing that they could resist any SLDF invasion. So I'm going to I'm going to pause real quick before we continue on. I would like to explain it's the greatest insult ever, but everyone from the Inner Sphere, right? Like, the actual people from the Inner Sphere are colloquially known as spheroids by the people in the periphery, which is just the greatest insult slash definition of a people I have ever heard. It's got the same energy as a flat earther calling you a globe head, and I love it. <laughs> We're gonna start up this globe head slander now, too. <laughs> <laughs> what are they gonna do take me to the edge oh no i'm so afraid <laughs> oh my god anyways the uh the periphery nations basically wrote off most of the sldf's blustering and uh grandstanding and came to believe that if they prepared enough like the Torian concordat then they would be able to resist any incursions they would come to find out in time that they were very, very, very wrong about this assumption, and I'm going to explain why. You see, Ian Cameron and the leadership of the SLDF, i.e. his wife, got together after probably the greatest night ever of Endless O-Face, because, you know, they are now Galactic Emperor and Empress in all but name, and they looked over all of the failings of their military. And instead of doing the classic smooth brain dictator thing, blaming everyone else, doing nothing to solve the problems, and then immediately launching another war, as one would expect in Battletech, they actually took a step back, put the brakes on the entire endeavor, and waited. They spent an enormous amount of time and, quite honestly, displayed a lot of humility and realism and got shit done. They entirely restructured the SLDF. They spent a huge amount of time retraining their soldiers and their forces along the periphery, working alongside the Great House militaries to update their tactics, their cohesiveness, and redo a lot of their training plans and such. And eventually, they managed to iron out the vast majority of their issues. You see, as much as Ian Cameron and the SLDF believed that they were a competent fighting force, these war games were treated seriously. If they were going to expose weaknesses, then they were going to happen now, in a controlled environment, rather than during a war. If there was deficiencies, if there was miscommunications, if there was potentially catastrophic problems in the command and control structure, they were going to find out about them now and they were going to fix them. And that is exactly what they did. Which, I'm going to be honest, is actually like the biggest brain thing ever. How many times do you actually see in fiction when a military gets humiliated this badly and they go, huh, damn, we suck. We should probably fix that. And then they actually go fix it. I'm going to say, uh, only time I can think of is this one. After years of this rebuilding and reorganizing, it left the SLDF as a truly terrifying foe. There was still problems with logistics. There was still issues coordinating with the Great House militaries, which were still around and uh, within the SLDF because, well, they were comprised of six different super states. But most of those issues were pretty much ironed out, and it was now a lean, mean machine ready for the greatest war in human history up until this point. And that led Ian Cameron to make the Pollux Proclamation. <clears throat> Ian Cameron goes, Eight, all your base are belong to us. Not an option to say no. It wasn't an official declaration of war, yet. 
but it was a very, very obviously a thinly veiled threat. Would you like me to read the gigabig quote about him, about the actual, like, proclamation? Uh, yes. I would, I would enjoy that, yeah. Okay, so, <clears throat> quote, Ian Cameron, the Star League stands for a unified humanity. As First Lord of the Star League, it is my solemn responsibility to protect the welfare of humanity wherever it may be found. Be it on Cyan or Santiago, New Vanderburg or New Avalon, Andurian or Apollo, Castor or Canopus. Through me, the Star League assumes the awesome task of safeguarding the welfare of humanity wherever it may be found. It is a responsibility from which the League will never shrink a responsibility it shall never lay down. The dark days of barbarism are over. We will not let them return again. The only way to ensure equal protection for all, the only way to safeguard the liberties of each individual, is for every human being to accept the benefits we offer freely and openly. So long as a solitary individual of the most distant planet in the periphery remains uneducated, impoverished, or disadvantaged, all are equally stricken. We intend to see that the majority is not denied the benefits of culture and progress at the hands of a minority of radical isolationists. We intend to extend our benevolent protection into every corner of human occupied space, whatever the cost, until every man, woman, and child prospers and flourishes. Let no one stand in the way of human progress. The time for reunification has come. The time for reunification is here. End quote. Ian Cameron, the Pollux Proclamation, about to fuck your shit up. An unofficial declaration of war. And I'm pretty sure you can see what I was saying. It's a little bit of the double think going on. It sounds very high and mighty and peace-minded, but when you actually look at the content of it, it's literally this guy going, everyone who is not us is barbarians, everyone who is not us are subhumans, everyone who is not us is wrong and we will conquer them. Submit and you shall live. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. On the surface, to the ignorant and the uneducated, this is a, this is a pretty high-minded, pretty great ideal, but... Man, it really sounds like something a dictator would say right before they, uh, right before they pull a no-no Germany. It's, it's a little, it's a little uncomfortable. Not so, the no-no Germany. Yeah, so this was, like I said, essentially a declaration of war against all human space not under the Star League, saying that they were going to bring everyone in, willingly or by force to the Star League. This... I, I want to take a moment just to talk about this for a second, because in most cases, this would be very black and white, like, oh, the Star League are, are you know, no-no Germans in space, ooh, but it's a lot more nuanced than that. The periphery realms, for the most part, are a really shit place to live. Like, for the most part, the people who left the inner sphere for the periphery ended up with a very hard life, or they were social outcasts and degenerates that created some really uncomfortable societies. The Torian Concordat is super heavily militaristic. They are extraordinarily authoritarian, even though they claim to want freedom and independence, and they're very backwards. Military technology is like the only thing they have that's even remotely close to the Inner Sphere, and even that is still old and relatively outdated. Like, people die of disease constantly, Things are generally not great. You know, hard labor for your entire life to scrape by is what most people can expect. And generally, things like um, education, healthcare, and a good quality of life is not really something you can expect unless you're in the upper crust of the periphery nations, right? By this point okay. as well, the Inner Sphere and the Star League is like humanity ascendant. The very best technology you could ever ask for. People all across the Inner Sphere genuinely are experiencing a boom in wealth, quality of life, Medicare, uh, industry, technology, opportunity, that the likes of which has never been seen before. It, the, the difference in the quality of these nations genuinely was insane, right? Like, it was, it was incredible. So, you can kind of understand where the Star League is coming from on this one. And another one of the factions, which... I, I was going to straight out say it, okay? The Magistry of Canopus, they deserve to be curb stomped out of the universe. They, they didn't deserve to exist. The Magistry of Canopus 
is basically a bunch of hedonistic, pleasure-driven cultists. There, there, there's really no other way to put that. Their entire society basically revolves around self-pleasure. And th 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 there's, there's, there's no other How way to phrase that. that? All the ways that you can mean that. It sounds bad, and the deeper you delve into it, it just gets worse. Okay, it, so, it, so it, that is, in fact, the way that that is meant. Okay. Yeah. Um, it is a society that I can confidently say, even if there are good parts about it, even if there are good people in it, just destroy them. Just nuke every planet into ash. They don't need to join the Star League. They, they didn't even want to. Who cares? Just burn all the planets to glass. We don't need them. We're better off without them anyways. Yeah. Man, hit them with the who cares. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think what the Star League is doing was particularly good, but there are arguments to be made that they weren't entirely wrong, and that Ian Cameron and the first few generations of Cameron ruleship, uh, you know, leadership over the Star League were benevolent dictatorships, and that humanity genuinely did improve because of it. The other thing is, like, is it colonialism? I don't know, maybe. Like, in real life, a lot of the colonial empires use the same arguments, and it was really, really bad in real life, but there isn't anything in the periphery to take. Like, the reason the colonial empires were that brutal in real life is that they didn't give a rat, rat's ass about their colonies, they just wanted the diamonds, or the rubber, or the oil, or the raw resources they that they the had. wanted the materials that yeah. were there. They, they just wanted the stuff that was there. But like I said, the periphery is really poor and really backwards and really underdeveloped. And in space, you can find those materials on another world that you don't have to fight over. You can just find another world, prospect it that's empty in your territory, and then just start mining operations, right? Like, you don't need to go to war for this. So it's less about colonialism. And I think, I think for the most part, even though there was a lot of very underhanded reasons for the Great Houses to want this war, right? I do genuinely think that the dictator in charge was doing it for a benevolent reason, even if it was stupidly misguided. But, argue in the comments below. I want to know what people think. I've seen a lot of different interpretations of the uh, reunification war. So let me know what you guys think down below. I'm genuinely curious. I, I mean, I guess I'm genuinely curious as well. Um, please, please do let me know and uh, let Canadian know in uh, separate comments. <laughs> you need to farm as many comments as possible for that YouTube algorithm. Let's go. So, the Pollux proclamation was basically a bombshell, right? You, you pulled the pin on a hand grenade and you dropped it into the center of the room. The periphery realms saw this for what it was, a declaration of a war, and immediately went on high alert. The Rimworld's Republic bordering House Steiner was kind of in a terrible situation because the ruling family, the Amaris family, actually thought that joining the Star League would be a good idea because if this conflict was coming, they might be able to join in diplomatically and become, for lack of a better term, first amongst equals or get preferential treatment by being the only one of the periphery that didn't resort to violence. And so on the right side of the battle is basically yeah, what they're pretty, trying to pretty get much. On. They're like, yeah, we wanna we wanna back the winner. We don't want to back the loser. You know, freedom is great and all that, but only if you're actually around to enjoy it. Just call um, them Italy. Pretty much, yeah, that's a that's a that's a good analogy. Unfortunately, the actual citizenry wanted absolutely nothing to do with the Star League, so there there's some conflicts brewing over there. Um, and this is why we don't let the citizens have say. Yeah, the, the Torn Concordat, like I explained to you in the last video, is the literal definition of loads shotgun with malicious intent, hippity hoppity, get the fuck off my property. So they immediately went to a war footing, retooling their entire economy and setting up basically everything for a long war of attrition, and the magistry, magistracy of Canopus was like, I guess I'll die. And that was that for them. They really didn't do much to prepare. They were, were too busy getting really, really high. And the only other one, so this- hey man, th They were just living their best life till the end. That, yeah, that's pretty all much. they needed. The only faction that I that I can really say that I totally, totally think is in the wrong for, for getting invaded is the Outworlds Alliance. They bordered the Draconis Combine and the Federated Sons. They just wanted to be left alone. 
They traded with the great houses. They shared technology. There was no diplomatic issues. They, they just wanted to be left alone to govern themselves, and they would be willing to go along with basically anything. They just didn't want to be part of the Star League. They just wanted self-rule. And basically, yeah, they would have been allowed, sorry. Yeah, they, they would have been happy just being like an unincorporated territory or something, right? Like they 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 were chill. There we go. Yeah, they didn't even have a military. The Outworld's Alliance had a grand total of like a hundred mechs. That's it. Across all of their worlds. They could barely bring more than 10 of them to bear at the same time. Meanwhile, the Star League was getting ready to throw thousands of mechs at them. And you're just like, dude, come on. This is such grotesque overkill. Why are you like this? Just leave the small child alone. You gotta teach the kid a lesson every now and then, you know? So the Pollux Proclamation set a lot of different diplomatic and military actions into action across the periphery, but one of the most significant ones was the Manchester Directive. Now, I kind of need to explain this. Like I mentioned, right, the Rimworld's Republic, bordering the um, Lyrian Commonwealth, was, for the most part, controlled by one family, just like the Great Houses were controlled by one family. This was the Amaris family, and at the time, the first consul of the Rimworld's Republic was Gregory Amaris. And in 2575, when the Pollux Proclamation happened, basically immediately afterwards, he followed up with the Manchester Directive, which again was a political attempt to become first amongst equals, and followed the imposition of an earlier act by the Star League, which you know, basically he could have just agreed to everything that Ian Cameron wanted to ensure peace with the Star League, but he went a step further. He began disarming a number of the military forces within um, the Rimworld's Republic, and specifically outlawed membership in something called the Rift Republican Army. And this is really significant because the Rift Republican Army was essentially the most prestigious honor guard kind of thing of the Rimworld Republic. Only the extremely prestigious of society, only war heroes and military veterans that saw active combat and the very best society had to offer were allowed to actually join this, and they were extremely... That seems like a very bad idea to outlaw. Oh like, yeah, it was a really bad idea, because it was an army made up of almost exclusively hyper-nationalists and ultra-loyalists. It was... it was not a good idea. It ended... I wonder about, how this could go wrong. Oh, yeah, take a wild guess. You'll probably be right. I don't know, I don't know. They, they, might, they might rebel or something. I don't know. Oh, Certainly man. Dude. Certainly, they would they would uh, keep with the loyalty of the state. Oh, of course, dude. Your your middle your middle school English teacher is probably so happy you read into those context clues. Good job, Steve. You get a passing mark on high school English. Thank you, Mrs. Rust. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was, however, a ceremonial position, but it was considered an extreme honor, and it was also filled with people who were very competent, right? Now, the RRA had once been a military unit, but by the mid-26th and 27th century, those days were gone, right? It was still full of respectable ex-servicemen, like I said, but when this proclamation came through, when the Manchester Directive followed it, it set the stage for a civil war. The RRA radicals essentially seceded from the Rimworld's Republic, and attacked the capital world, attempting to assassinate Gregory Amaris and overturn the decision. Their anger was so absolute that it swiftly turned into open civil war and conflict, as many of the forces who were loyal to Amaris began actively suppressing any dissent, openly seizing property without legal precedent, and outright killing people in order to stifle dissent. It, that's typically not how you want to go around those things. Uh, typically yeah. Typically makes the problem worse. Yeah. And to make matters worse, in order to kind of garner this sympathy with the Star League, Amaris had spent years before this alienating the population by favoring inner sphere companies and um, Star League corporations and institutions, right? Giving them more power in the Rimworld's Republic and advancing their interests over domestic industry and companies. A situation that was made even worse 
by the fact that he was like, okay, taxes, set that shit to maximum. The slider cannot go any further to the right, as far as that shit will go. Basically to steal shit from his own people and to pad his own account. So this was like classic dictator stuff. And the end result of this is that the Rimworld's Republic was split in two. The northern part of the Rimworld's Republic, or the part on the northern border of House Steiner, was loyal to Amaris. The part that was on, yeah, the part that was on the eastern border of House Steiner and the uh, Lyrian Commonwealth were the rebels. And they used, the reason they managed to take control of almost a full half of the Rimworld's Republic, even though they weren't like an actual military, it was like an honor position, is because the Rimworld's Republic is a very narrow band of worlds, right? The Great Houses are very wide and very tall in terms of like their layout, like their their floor plan, right? They're very big, yeah. they're chunky, they're thick their boys. Floor plan. Yeah. The, the Rimworld's Republic is like a small ribbon on the border of um, the Lyrian Commonwealth. It's only two, maybe three worlds deep at most before you get to uncolonized and uncharted worlds and empty space beyond that. And there was a choke point, roughly where the cutoff was, where there was only a single charted world that actually connected the two sides of the Rimworld's Republic and that's where the divide happened. That's where the rebels managed to secede and everything on the eastern side of it became rebel. Everything on the northern side of it was Amaris loyalist. And this was not good at all. Because the political instability began bleeding over into the Lyrian Commonwealth, who began sending in its own military, who began asking for the Star League to please, for the love of God, help. We need to go to war right now. And that started dragging in SLDF forces as the conflict began spilling over into Lyrian space, which means that by treaty, the Star League had to intervene. It was, it was just a, it was a flipping disaster. The Star League was not ready to engage its war yet as it wanted to attack in all directions at the same time to guarantee that none of these periphery nations could support one another. Mm -hmm. And this was basically happening before they could get all their troops into position. The Star League didn't want to fully risk their invasion now on the assumption that if the other periphery nations saw the Star League moving, they might preemptively attack bases and anchorages and fleet yards within inner sphere space, trying to cripple their offensive capability. So they basically held off for a little while as the civil war began and started raging. And here is where we're going to get close to ending the video. Big Sag. Well, I mean, you said you didn't want to go for like two hours, so we're chopping it up for next oh, week. Oh, uh, I mean... We, we, we gotta keep on the edge of their seat, you know? Yeah, we also, we, we're we monetized now, so we gotta milk that content. Gotta give people a reason to tune back in. Oh, of course, that's how you do. You get them right to the edge of glory, and then you just cut them off. You force them to pay again, come back later. The actual causes of the Reunification War were very deep running. So... The periphery nations in the Great Houses had warred between one another for centuries up until this point, trading worlds for worlds, generally fighting one another, skirmishing on the border, all of that, that wonderful stuff. In terms of defense, the Inner Sphere and the Great Houses are extremely paranoid. Do you know Ro ancient Rome's strategy? Like, why they invaded so much stuff and turned the Mediterranean into a lake? Kind of, uh... Go ahead and explain. Them. Okay, so the Romans were, they were terrified of barbarians and outside peoples, and they couldn't impose order and stability in the regions outside of their borders, and the regions outside of their borders were scary and full of terror. So the Romans thought, you know what would be a great idea? What if the regions that were outside our border were inside of our border, and then we could impose order on them? And so basically, concept. yeah, the entire point, the entire mentality of the inner sphere is aggressive peacekeeping. We are going to aggressively invade all of our neighbors to ensure that we are safe. 
The problem with that is every time they invaded someone, they just ended up getting deeper into unfriendly space and having more and more directions they needed to engage the hostiles from. So it was spiraling out of control. And this was yet again another thing like that. The Inner Sphere Great Houses basically wanted to preemptively invade the periphery to guarantee security on their outer borders, which were some of the least fortified and least secure, which kind of ignores the fact that the periphery is a bit of a shithole and they don't really have the capability to feed themselves, much less feed an invading army. So, you know, it is what it is, is that with the end of the Age of War and the Star League, there was no more large scale fighting. And the Great Houses were terrified that if fighting stopped, they would lose a lot of the expertise and a lot of the proficiency that they had built up over the years in their military forces, and they were afraid of losing that power. So they wanted a way to keep their military active, both so that they could keep their skills sharp, but also so that potentially, potentially, they would have justifications to keep their militaries big, because they really, really liked having that big stick in their pocket, which is pretty unjustifiable. And to kind of assist the rest of the Inner Sphere in following along with what the upper leadership wanted, a widespread, massive propaganda campaign kicked off, where they basically portrayed the periphery as, well, barbarians. Poor, uneducated, stupid, disease-ridden, very smelly, and generally either oppressed by insane governments, or generally so ineffective and inefficient that they were suffering and didn't even realize it. Yeah, some of them were also portrayed as, for lack of a better term, deserving to be conquered for their degenerate lifestyle, which, you know, take a wild guess which one of them they painted in that light. Canopus. Oh, the Capellans? <laughs> Okay, invading the Capellans, the entire Star League <laughs> betraying the Capellans and invading them would have been fucking hilarious, and I wish it had happened, but no, it was the Magistry of Canopus. Damn. Yeah. Close. <laughs> Ironically enough, a really, really big part of the propaganda, and one of the ones that really stuck for most of the Inner Sphere, was framing it as a pseudo-religious crusade to bring back the wayward kin of humanity, to reunite all the tribes of man sort of thing back under one banner. That one is a narrative that really stuck for a lot of the general public, and they kind of latched onto that as if they were freeing the periphery from tyranny by being tyrants. On the Inner Sphere side, of course, we have all the Great Houses, the Federated Sons, the Free Worlds League, the Lyrian Commonwealth, the Capellan Confederation, and the Draconis Combine, alongside the Terran Hegemony. By this point, the Terran Hegemony is, is less of its own faction, and it has, like, become the Star League, so we're just gonna call it the Star League. So it's five Great House militaries, which are already way more impressive than anything the Periphery has, and the SLDF, which makes it the biggest force ever assembled against the Rimworld's Republic, who is busy fighting a civil war against itself, the Outworld's Alliance, who basically doesn't have a military and are just poor innocent farming boys, the um, Canopus, Magistracy of Canopus, which is just a bunch of degenerates huffing drugs out in space, and then the Torian Concordat, which is the only one that's actually fortified with a large military. I don't see what could go wrong with the peripheries in this, I mean, if I'm being honest. I yeah, mean, uh... Certainly they wouldn't as handedly. Three out of four of the periphery that... Not only are they outnumbered, they are hilariously outgunned, and three out of four of them are just in absolutely no state to fight a war. The Rim... Half of the Rimworld's Republic wants to join the Star League, and the other half doesn't even have a successful, standing, official, large army. It's just like the remnants of a military unit, and then a massive amount of civilian volunteers and, like, raided armories and stuff. The, the uh, one, the half that wants to join the Star League, I mean, they should have some pretty nice backing if the Star League actually decides to help them out, which I'm sure they won't, but... Oh, yeah, they, they do. They do. The Star oh, League, oh. the Star League is oh. not dumb. <laughs> the Star League is not dumb. This happened earlier than the Star League wanted it to, but they're not going to let an opportunity like this go to waste. Unfortunately, 
If you guys want to hear about the actual conflicts, the ending results of the reunification war, and what happened yeah, to all four of the Don't hit him with unfortunately for this. <laughs> okay, fine. Let me restart it then. Fortunately for you guys, we're not going to talk about the interesting part this video, but you can check out the next video, shamelessly shilling for myself. Is that better, Steve? Yes, that is much better. There, there we go. Fantastic. Next episode, we're, we're going to talk about. Uh, we're yeah, shut up. We're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about what happened. Each of the four periphery nations. We're going to go over them one by one. How the conflict went. How quickly it was over. And how hard they got stomped. And then after we deal with the other three, we're going to talk about the Torin Concordat because they're the only ones that actually had significant fighting happen. Oh wait, no, I know what to add at the end. Even more shameless shilling. Uh, this is my second channel, my main channel. I do video game stuff. I do some Battletech stuff. I do some science fiction stuff. Go check me out there. Boom. Link is down in the uh, description of the video. I also stream on Twitch. I am, in fact, streaming today and tomorrow and Saturday. Go check me out on Twitch. Link is also down in the video description. Let's go. Shameless. The Patreon. the Patreon is still not up yet because I'm lazy and I haven't got around to doing it, even though, like, everything is, is ready to go. Soon, TM. <laughs> Soon, TM. Okay, uh, the shameless self promo over. Uh, give me all of your money, your life savings. This is not optional. This is in fact a threat. Otherwise, we're going to pull a Star League on you. And this is in fact also not sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, cut the video. Cut the video, Steve. We're done.